Okay, great. Good morning, everybody. It's a, a real pleasure to be here. And um, uh, as Mehdi said earlier on, he talked about Spanish. I'm kind of the opposite. Yo nunca aprendí español, pero me recuerdo algunas cosas. Uh, it's basically uh, the story. So my name is Steve Wilmot. I work for Red Hat now. I used to be the CEO of 3Scale, uh, API management company that was founded here in Barcelona. We still have a big team here in Barcelona, and we're always hiring, so come and talk to us. Uh, the team is downstairs uh, as well. I'm not going to talk about products, but go check it out at the booth. Um, as you may know, um, Red Hat was also recently acquired by IBM, so we have um, uh, good, good partners there as well, so go check out the IBM booth. So as I said, I'm not going to talk about products. I'm going to talk about something else. And I don't typically give that many API talks anymore because my job has changed in role. I'm a bit more broader. But APIs are still very close to my heart. So here's the title. It's the end of the beginning of APIs. Um, so what do I mean by that? Well, really, there's a lot of change that's happening in the industry. And I think we, it's, it's good to step back from where we are to see you know, what, what's going what's to happen in the future. There's some big picture topics that we've thought about over time that um, I will mention a little bit. But I really want to make it personal to your APIs. Right? This is a, uh, really a consumer APIs event. It's not an enterprise event. Uh, the folks told me, hey, don't talk about that boring enterprise stuff that you normally talk about. Uh, so I'll try to avoid doing that. But I'll try to make this personal to your APIs and give you some takeaways that you can go. And these subjects are things which I, I think are pretty important. And uh, good, good to think about to get out of the day-to-day the -day that you normally have. So you'll see some images throughout this. So this is my first favorite image. So the images actually come from uh, movie concepts for the movie Neuromancer, which is kind of, they're not sure they're going to make it yet. They were trying to make it. And Vincenzo Natali, his Twitter feed, you can get the images there. Um, and the, it's all copyright there. Uh, he actually isn't going to do the movie now. Someone else is going to do it. But still, we hope it will be great. So. Neuromancer is one of those science fiction books that I think kind of really defines the age it was written in and a lot of future ages. And um, so hopefully the movie will get, will get made. And the, the images are kind of relevant, but um, at least they make, they make it look good even if the words don't make any sense. So let's, let's proceed with that. So APIs have come a long way. So I started doing API type stuff even though I didn't know it was APIs way back in the mid-90s. Right? We were building systems using a technology called Corba, which if you're old enough to remember, we can go and have a beer afterwards. Uh, but most people in the room probably don't. So Corba was basically a messaging protocol, which you could connect to object request brokers, they were called together, and they would synchronize and send messages to, to each other. We were using that across the public internet at the time, which was kind of stupid, because it turned out that when you reboot, rebooted a Corba request broker, it changed all its local addresses. So those kind of things were the early days of APIs. Um, pretty bad, not designed for use over the public internet. XML came along. XML over HTTP came along in the late 90s, and we thought this would solve all problems. Uh, and it obviously created a whole bunch more of its own. And that's just the way of every technology. Every technology seems to be the new chosen thing, which will change a ton of things, brings its own problems. Hopefully, we're getting a little bit better each time. And I would argue that we, we genuinely are. So if you think about where we are today um, versus seven years ago, which is uh, no, uh, 12 years ago, which is when we created 3Scale, so 2007 is when we founded the company. Um, an API back then, we would talk to people about APIs, because that was when the Flickr API came out. The eBay was already there. Um, there was an iPhone, but there wasn't an app store. right? So it was a totally different time. Amazon EC2 had just launched. Um, and people would be like, why would I ever, ever open my machine to the public internet? I would have to be insane to do that. right? So back then, it was just an impossibility for people to think about. And it's just taken a long time. But here we are, and it's completely normal. Every organization I talk to of any size is doing APIs in one way or another. Um, we're all using pretty standard technologies. Many of those APIs work extremely well. They do pretty amazing things. So we have come a massive long way, right? Um, we now have tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of public APIs of various types. Um, if you count like, all the internal APIs that companies have, if you look at microservices and so on, we're probably up into the millions, right? So there's, there's a lot of APIs. We're still a long, long way behind the web. So the web right now has 1.5 billion sites, right? Uh, huge difference there. But the web is also older. 
So one of the reasons, well, the reason for the title is really is what do I mean by the end of the beginning? Well, I think we are still in that artisan phase. So most APIs are being created by hand. Most of the users, um, we have tooling, but still there's a design process going on. Uh, most of the, the users have to access by some manual process. They have to ask for a key, or they have to sign up for a key. They have to look at the documentation. They have to figure out how to write the code and so on. Um, we're often also curating the set of users that can use an API in a pretty aggressive way, right? So we're still very much at the beginning of APIs in one sense. But in the other sense, we have tens of thousands of these, and people are using them every day, and many of the technologies are very mature. So I do think we're in a pretty comparable situation as the web was maybe in the late 90s, um, or a little bit earlier than that. And I'm going to talk about some of the things that happened in the web that um, I think also need to happen in APIs. So there are a whole bunch of topics here. I'm not going to go into them all, but some important ones that change when we go from primarily curated, artisanal type of creation of sites or, web or APIs to mass adoption and mass usage. Copyright's a very important one. Discoverability changes, right? We have to go from directories where we manually update what's available to genuine search, still not done for APIs, hard to do. Ease of creation has to change. If you think about what happened in the web, um, at the beginning, you were writing CGI scripts or even just plain HTML, hacking HTML in a text editor. I, I did that way back then. Um, now, it's completely different, right? In, on the web, who, who remembers GeoCities? GeoCities, we have a couple, well, you guys are showing your age. Yeah, so GeoCities. GeoCities, for those of you that you don't remember, uh, was probably the first way you could create a website on the, on the internet in, in like 94, 95, whenever it came out, that did not require code. You could go in and edit some stuff, and it would create a web page. That was completely magical. Most of the web pages, to be fair, were just a big banner which did blink and said, I am here, right? But still, you know, it was somebody's personal web page on the web, so that was pretty important. Um, and then, obviously, we've gone to WordPress and TypePad and all sorts of other ways of creating websites that made it possible for the masses to do. Ease of use, very important thing to change. Security, always critical. And I'll talk a bit about semantics and, and syntax a little bit at the end as well. But there are some massive changes which are coming, whether we like it or not. But they're also necessary for APIs to become the driving force behind the web and get to the same level of adoption as the web. And you might think, well, maybe that isn't even important. Um, but I actually think it is. Because the web today has changed radically. You can do a lot more with websites than you could 20 years ago. However, um, it's also changed in the sense that it's much uh, less standard in a way. So a lot of people consume their content now via Facebook or via Twitter or via some other platform. We have all sorts of other ways of accessing content. So um, Alexa, for example, or, or Google Home, which is voice access. Uh, we have IoT devices. I think it's definitely the case that we're going to have a, a shift towards consumption of content and generating of actions, especially in the consumer space, which is at all not driven by the web browser anymore. The web browser is not the most important thing in the next 10 years in terms of access to the internet. And so APIs actually are. APIs are going to be the gateway for most brands and most systems uh, for the general human population to interact with them. They may not know it. They may not be looking at that API and looking at the API itself. But we've, we're changing. We're diversifying the way things are accessed. So this, these things are important. So I'm going to talk about five things, um, mass API usage and users, API creation and creators, copyright uniqueness, security, and then syntax and semantics for the end. Um, but before I start, I'm going to ask you guys a question. So. Um, you, the APIs that you run, do you feel proud of them? How proud do you, like if you, raise your hand if you're proud of the APIs that you run. Well, there's a few tentative hands. Come on! You built a system. See, look, raise the hands higher, raise more hands. You built a system which five or 10 years ago would have been nearly impossible, right? Someone can just log in and remotely access, get data or process a transaction on a platform. And probably many of you have thousands and hundreds of thousands of users potentially accessing that, which I'll talk a bit later. So you should be a little bit more proud of what we've done. You may not love the design. You may be a little bit worried about this thing or that, right? That's the day-to-day, -day, but zoom out a bit. Like, this is really important. In most cases, the APIs that I see, 
they're fundamental to the company's business, right? And they're actually the future of the company's business. So I think you can be a bit, bit prouder. Now also do the thought experiment. Think five years into the future. How, who will your users be of that API? What will they be doing with your API? Um, just think a little bit about the next five years, right? The, and the five years is a trick question because most people overestimate the impact of change in two years kind of time frame, but they totally underestimate in five years. In five years, if you think back five years from now, we're in a totally different place. So there's a lot of big things coming for your API. So I'll try to talk to you a little bit about how to prepare for that. So I'm going to start with the first topic. So mass API usage and users. So when I asked about who the API users will be, I'm guessing that many of you would have thought about developers, which is exactly the right thing to think about, um, apart from it's wrong. So developers are very critical, and I'll talk about how in a moment. And obviously, that's the mantra in the API world. Developers are the kingmakers. They make everything happen. And it's definitely true in a certain sense. But I want you to think about the end users of the API the people that consume the data that's coming through the API, the people that generate the queries and the transactions that make a purchase or that, that make a change in their, their profile or whatever it is they're doing by their API. That's tens or hundreds, uh, that's like hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of X more than the actual developers. And the reason I want you to think about those end users is because often when you think about them, you'll figure out how to serve them better because they're the end consumers of what you're doing. It's actually a lot of times better to think of developers as partners. Partners are helping you reach those audiences. And the reason I say that is if you project out into the future with this mass adoption of APIs or the mass usage, um, most of those end users will probably be consuming it through an app. Others might be consuming it via something like IFTTT uh, or Zapier or one of these aggregators that's pulling things together. But many of them will be consuming it through a device like Alexa or some other thing that they don't even know there's an API underneath. So it's important to think about that. Another story, uh, there's a company called SimilarWeb, which we know very well. We've worked with a lot in the past. They had an API. It's a marketing company. They have web ranking data. So they tell marketers where their website ranks against which queries and so on. They created an API. It was pretty successful. So a lot of people were using it. Um, but it wasn't really taking off as much as they wanted. So they ended up actually um, surveying the users, and they found out that many of them just didn't have technical resources available to integrate with the API, right? That's pretty normal, actually. This happens a lot, even within large organizations. So what they did was they created plugins for Google Docs, Excel, access databases, a whole bunch of those things, right? Pretty boring stuff. Pretty quickly, within about six months, 80% of the traffic on the API was from those plugins. Right? Turns out their audience, their users, were marketers who didn't have technical resources available. Right? So think about your API and how it's being used today, which departments in your organization might be using them, or which kind of user, and think about how you could get the API to them without them having to be too technical. And you might not do that next week or, to, or the week after, but in the long run, that's what's going to drive a lot of your success for the API. So think about that. On the developer front, developers are, are really still very, very important. Um, I'm actually on record on some other event, I think it might have been an API Days event, of saying that developer experience is overrated. So um, that's kind of a, a, a thing that it sounds extreme, but I actually stand by it. So I think it is very important in the sense that you should do a good job for your developers, right? There are great tools out there. Um, 3 scale and other vendors make them, so you should use them and you should adopt best practices and keep your developers happy. But the reason developers are going to use your API is actually to do with what the API does and what, ser what users you can potentially serve. So try to make sure you get that right as well. If you have an API which has an amazing developer experience but no one really cares about the data or what you're enabling them to do, you've wasted your time. So make sure you do something that's valuable to end users and developers will um, then help work with you to make the API good. But, so do work on the developer experience, but it's not the only thing that matters. So my takeaway here is think about thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands more people, and think about the end users. And think of those developers as partners in reaching those, audience, those users. Next is API creation. So one of the big problems in our current state of APIs is that 
the API creators are um, limited, right? There's a limited number of us that can create APIs that can really do the kind of things that we need to do. And it's hard. Um, if you think about what happened in the web, then at some point, it became possible for non-specialists to, to create web pages as well, right? Um, that's what I said with all these automated tools. I actually think that over the next five years, that's going to become more and more critical, uh, especially because many of the departments in your organization will probably want to do specialist things. So if you think of the web analogy, right now, a team will want to create a single page landing spot right, for a particular campaign they're running for the next month, and then they want to take it away. Now, you could say, my API is perfect. They can use it to create the landing page, and uh, they can use the same API for the next landing page, the next landing page, the next landing page. So that will work to an extent. But I actually think we'll get into the world where we'll need to create custom APIs for short periods of time. Uh, we'll get into the world where the APIs have to match the domain in a specific way. So I, I really think that think about two things when you're working on creating your current APIs. How do you work with the domain experts in your company to make those APIs better, to reflect the reality of what's going on versus just being a set of methods that you think are kind of cool and that, that, that cover the domain or cover the database that you're exposing? And the other thing is think about automating as much as possible. So think about how to create APIs and tear them down in a relatively short amount of time. Think about how to manage the clients for those APIs. Start to think about how you can capture requests from other teams that need APIs and how you could um, more easily process those. So this is a very tricky area, right? We're not good at this yet. Um, there have been quite a few companies that have tried to create sort of the, the WordPress for APIs. It's a difficult market for a whole bunch of reasons, um, but I think that it's, it's coming and it's the kind of thing that we, we need in order to, to make APIs more ubiquitous um, over, over the web as a whole. And my takeaway is here. So try to co-design your APIs with some of these domain specialists in your company and try to automate as much as possible. Um, there's many, many things you can automate. Um, it's more of a, you could give a whole talk on that, but I'll, I'll skip that for now. So the third area is uniqueness and copyright. So I asked you earlier on to be proud of your APIs. Um, people reluctantly did so. I think that might be a European thing. Um, I'm British as well, so uh, same, same problem applies to me, more or less. Um, Brexit accepted. Um, so I stand by that. Be proud of your APIs. But how many people in the audience think that their API design is, is a kind of a differentiator in the market? So who thinks their API, the design of their API is kind of the differentiator? So no hands. Maybe it's because you know what's coming. <laughs> so I think it's great if you come up with a great API design. And that's a very important thing. Try to make your API design as good as possible. Um, as you probably know, there's some copyright um, lawsuits going on, Oracle versus Google, right now about the Java APIs and their use in Android. Um, at one, so I'm going to talk about this at two levels. So the first level is the legal level. That court case is still unresolved. Um, anyone that you talk to, um, I'm pretty opinionated on this, so also don't take this as a red hat opinion, take this as a personal opinion. I think it's very dangerous. The, the idea that you can copyright the design, the structure, or the method structure of an API puts us all in danger because many APIs are very similar. And the idea that you know, you're taking two parameters as input and re returning a certain type and that that is copyrighted it gets very dangerous. Because even if you don't think you're going to be sued by someone, you think someone might, might attack you, then it's a chilling effect. right? You're not going to use that pattern. And there are not that many logical patterns. right? So it's a, a very dangerous thing to have copyright on APIs. Um, but it's understandable that people want to protect the thing they've created. They've worked hard to, to do something. So uh, the question is, how do you deal with that? I would argue that we should definitely not be seeing copyright on APIs. Um, and I think as a community, we should be proactive about sharing our API designs. So if you have a unique API, the upside of it being unique and good, if it's unique and bad, nobody cares, right? That's, that's fine. Um, if it's unique and good, the upside is, hey, people will gravitate towards your API. So it's a differentiator. I'd rather use a really good API than from another company that isn't that good, right? So that's a differentiator. So that's a positive. However. If you then protect that so that no one else can use the same structure, I would argue it becomes a negative for you. Because what's going to happen is you're over here and everyone else is over here. And as we go into mass adoption, 
we're going to be automating the client generation. We're going to be having many, many more people trying to write systems. And the more idiomatic and closer to the mainstream your API is, the more likely it'll get adopted, right? So if you produce something great, then by all means use the, the, the advantage you gain from that. But it's even better if you share it, because that way the mainstream comes to you, right? And you get both benefits. You get the benefit of being the leader and being better than everybody else, but you also get the benefit of, of getting that mass adoption long run. So I'm not going to say too much more about this, but um, if you're interested in API copyright, come and find me in the break. It's definitely one of my favorite topics. Um, there's a lot of things we, we should do here. But just think about your own APIs. If you're tempted to say, these are my copyright, and I, I want to hold on to them, um, legal precedent is like 50-50 right now. Uh, but just from an adoption standpoint, think about being mainstream versus being unique. Um, and the last point here is, if you're in an industry, um, it would actually be very helpful if people could write clients that work with multiple companies in that industry. So maybe at this event, you'll find competitors that, that are in your industry. Talk to them. Talk to them about their APIs. You might actually save yourselves a, a ton of work on the actual interface, because really your differentiator is your brand, it's your data, it's your users, it's your reach, it's all the other things you do rather than the API design. Security and trust, this is a massive topic, could deserve a, uh, a talk by itself. Very, very challenging if you look at the next five years, right? It's already, there have been lots of breaches in the last few years, um, API breaches and web breaches. There have even been breaches where the breach was on a partner, right? So uh, an API is adopted, they have partners, companies use the API, and then the partner is breached. So lots of challenging topics here. Um, I think there are some security talks in the program as well, which we we'll definitely recommend going to. Um, the biggest difference I see between companies who are looking at security topics, first of all, sometimes people make an assumption that people don't care, right? It's like this thing that goes to the side. I don't see that. I see almost every API owner I know care deeply about security. The challenge is, how do you, like, what do you do about it? And unfortunately, there's no easy answer. Definitely keep looking at best practice. There are tools out there. You should use them. But it's an evolving game. And what I'm actually going to do instead is recommend two books, which are not security related. So probably most of the people have heard of this book, The Black Swan, um, by Nassim Taleb. Um, it's a nonfiction book. And basically, it talks about the concept of if you've only ever seen white swans, so swans are white, right? Um, you would not expect that there are black swans. But it turns out, in Australia and New Zealand, there are black swans. So the point here from a security analogy is security is just one of those things where, you know, in your mind, you think, well, as long as I do a reasonable job, if something does happen, we'll probably figure out how to fix it. So that's kind of in the middle of the, of the road. But the black swan tells you that most of the time, things look totally fine. But here, right on the edge, there's a mega event, which is absolutely catastrophic. Right? And so if you took the average, it looks pretty good. But when you're in this catastrophic mega event, it's extremely bad. So if you're a small company, medium company, or a large company, literally a significant breach can massively harm your business. Right? So that's this black swan scenario. So I think it's really important to think about security as something you invest in over time. So even if you've never seen a breach, if you think you're fine, or you think you're not a target, keep investing. Try to take. What is it, 10%, 20%, 30% of your energy and have a team focus continually on this problem. Uh, it really, really is important. You don't want to be uh, breached. And um, keep thinking about that. Um, and, and my point here is it's continuous even if you haven't been breached, right? Um, and uh, it, it, it's not something where you can just tick a box and done. You've got to keep iterating at it. This, by the way, the diagram is the SenseNet pyramid from Neuromancer, which is something they breached during the film. Uh, during the book. The other book is a sci-fi book called Body of Glass. So I really like this book. It's a little bit old now, but uh, in the book, um, it's kind of apocalyptic. So every little city-state has its own glass bubble that people live in, and they all have their own firewall. And the nice thing you see in the film is like literally during the book, they're trying to defend themselves against attacks the entire time. So th and everything between the cities is like this wild space. And um, while I don't want to be a scaremonger, like literally that is the internet today. Like there's this, we have safe servers, we have safe clients, and then we have these wild spaces in between, and they are pretty dangerous already. Um, hopefully, 
by building the right kind of trust between the locations that are safe, we'll end up with better ways of protecting ourselves. But unfortunately, this is just a reality. And um, I don't want to, you know, we could spend a lot of time on specific techniques. Um, again, we can, something we can talk about afterwards. But um, the general mindset is the important one. Um, just try to keep investing, try to keep thinking about how things could go wrong. And uh, I'll give an example in the last segment, which will make you laugh as well. So it's something you're never done with. And um, just keep, try, try to allocate a team member to put this utmost in their brain or however many team members you can spare. So the last topic, I'm getting close to the end, uh, syntax versus semantics. So this sounds like a highfalutin technical thing. Um, probably most people know what this means. So syntax typically is the building blocks of a language, so uh, specific words right, that I would use in constructing a sentence and the rules for how those things go in order. Semantics is the meaning behind that. So what does it mean when I use a particular word? What does it mean when I put certain words in combination and so on? And there's a couple of reasons why this is going to be very important within APIs. Um, it already is important, but it's going to become more important. Um, a nice example of what syntax and semantics is is like, for example, syntax, the word Brexit, right? Syntax. And, but the semantics are so complicated, not even the British government has figured out what exactly it means yet, right? So uh, you can go infinitely deep with this. Um, but there's a, there's a point to this, which is your APIs, as developers, we typically build syntax, right? We're actually building an OAI specification. Um, or an async API specification or some other thing which defines what the API does. And we are hoping that the developer on the other side who's writing the client can understand what we mean. So we're hoping that this piece of syntax is actually going to allow someone to infer semantics. And then two things happen. You implement a server, right, the server side of the API, on your understanding of what the semantics are, so you associate meaning with the code that you write that implements your interface, which is the syntax. And on the other side, the developers all fire up the documentation and go, oh, I know what this means. And then they write a client on their interpretation of the semantics. Now, right now, this works, right? Because we're all pretty smart, and we can generally figure it out. And when we don't, we get an error, and we write an angry email. And the developer on the other side says, no, that's not what I meant. I meant a different thing. And maybe they even update the documentation, right? The point is we have human beings in the loop to mediate the semantics. Um, but there's a couple of things that are happening that make that very, very tricky going forward. So one example is we have different types of APIs now. Most people, I think REST has been the dominant wave to get people on the API train in the last few years. That's changing radically. Like we have um, event-based APIs. Um, we have other variants like GraphQL and so on. These are all valid APIs, but they use different syntaxes. Um, now, the semantics are often the same. So if you imagine a car hire API, right? Um, the car hire API has behind it a database, um, which is the cars and the hires and the contracts and so on. And that has a certain set of semantics. I might express in a REST API a bunch of operations you can do against me. You can make a booking and so on. I might have another, an event-based API, which notifies you when your car is ready, for example, right? So suddenly, we're using two, two structural constructs to talk about the same core semantics. So one of the reasons that semantics and being deliberate about your meaning is really important now is because you probably won't just have REST. You'll have many things that link to the same set of core concepts. The other reason is that a lot of the time, we're going to start generating automatic clients. Those automatic clients don't have the developer brains to figure out what your semantics are. So in the long run, you're going to have to document your semantics formally. And the, the earlier you start in being sure, OK, when I have this method, what does it really mean? Um, yes, it updates the table, but OK, what it means is a booking is created, and this booking has a certain set of parameters and so on. So think about the meaning as you're building things. And just a little example on here. So I, I count myself as relatively technically savvy, right? So I have a PhD. I started a tech company, ran it reasonably successfully for a while. Um, and um, uh, you know, I can do two-factor two auth or whatever else, right? Understand auth. Um, but I have a, a new home in Austin. It's pretty modest, but one of the things that it happens is it has all sorts of IoT switches and hue and all these different things in the thing. And I've been there six months. I've tried multiple times. I still have not figured out how to connect everything together. Because someone took the original Wi-Fi network out, everything is out of sync. And even funnier, I actually thought I was getting the lighting working, 
But it turned out I was actually controlling the lights in someone else's house in San Francisco. <laughs> and that's because I had stale open auth tokens against my old Hue bridge, which I had given to Nicola, who's one of the co-organizers of this conference. So I was turning the lights in and on and off in Nicola Granny's. And you can just imagine, like, we had two API experts, him and me, on the phone, trying to figure out what the hell was going on. And we finally got into the account and managed to cancel these OAuth tokens. So anyway, um, no shade. This is very complicated stuff. Point is, try to get the semantics right, and then you start to make better decisions about how to do things. So I'm almost out of time. But try to be deliberate about that meaning as you document things. So some conclusions. Think further. Think ahead. Your audience is probably much bigger than you think. Developers are critical, don't get me wrong, but think about those end users. API creation, it's, right now it's kind of cool. You're the engineers, you get to do that, right? Um, you're the, the source of truth, the kind of knights of the round table when it comes to creating APIs. But it's really in your interest to involve more and more people. And try to get those APIs designs sh shared and spread within your industry. It will make everybody's life easier. We'll have to write 10 or 100x less code if we have um, shared core APIs for many of the, the things that we, we all work on. And security is this ongoing thing. I think you just cannot escape. Um, it is very important. The more you, you kind of work, not just with incidents you've seen, but incidents that you, you, um, you can try to brainstorm as to what's going to happen, I think the more successful you'll be. And the last one, I think, is almost the most important. We're going to move into a place where REST is not the only protocol, right? There are plenty of others. And we're going to move into a place where the, the meaning behind your API calls is going to become much more important, because it will make you, make you able to generate more APIs more quickly, and it will enable people and automated systems to understand those APIs. So that's all I got. Thank you very much. And I'm really looking forward to an amazing conference. Thank you. So in case you have any questions, just raise your hand. I'll reach you. And I'll gotta give you some time to think about it, because I actually have a question. So with all this good stuff that you show us, do you have a company, an entity, a person that you think is really going in the right direction you know, with, all, with all this stuff going on? I know that's probably going to be kind of a hard question. But mm. you got anybody that you think those guys are doing it right? I have a few. That Except I that, you. No. I, <laughs> yeah, of course, we're doing everything perfectly. That's also not true. Um, you know, it's, it's a little bit hard to think of an example uh, who's like, doing right across the whole spectrum of these things. I think there are companies. So, certainly, one of the challenges is that a lot of the examples are kind of the standard ones, like the Twilio, Stripe, and so on, right, which are more enterprise. They're not necessarily consumer facing. I would say probably one of the best companies in terms of organizing their APIs for ease of use and access is Stripe. Um, they even do things like you can carry the version that you have when you sign up with them for as long as you want, and those kind of things. Right? There's, there's a lot of amazing best practice there. In terms of consumer-facing APIs, it's a little bit hard to pin down. But I do, there are plenty of companies um, that have really used APIs that are advantage, so physical products. I mean, sportswear category, I'm not going to name names. There are some here in the room, and there are others in the world, right? But they combine physical product with digital platforms that really are meaningful for people, right? So I have a, I have a Fitbit. Um, it's super meaningful for me to actually see the tracking of the data. Like, it affects yeah. my behavior. Mm -hmm. So those kind of things are genuinely valuable for the general, general populace. And I think you'll see examples in all sorts of industries like that. OK. Yeah. Anybody has a question? We've got one volunteer. It's going to be the last one, because we we're a little bit in late. Sure. Sorry, I ran just like a minute over. So. Oh. Thanks a lot for, present, for, for the presentation. Yeah, I'm Lorenzino Vaccari from the Joint Research Center. We know each other yesterday yep. evening. Um, I have a question. You were talking about machine-to-machine uh, -machine discoverability and composition, right? Yes. And you know that we, we discussed yesterday. I'm uh, leading a, um, a project on API for governments. Mm -hmm. And one of the questions that the stakeholders, they asked me for the study was, I mean, can you find the right API? How can you find it? Do we have an API catalog for governments in Europe? And once you have found it, how can you use it? How can you combine in a semi-automatic way the APIs? So I discovered that the situation is not so, so good uh, right now. But I would like to know from you um, how much time 
do you think it will pass to have this kind of systems in, in a way that I'm not talking only about API catalogs, huh? I'm talking about something that is automatically discovered on the web. Thanks. Sure. Yeah, great question. So the first thing I will say is um, the, the amount of time depends on the people in this room, right? So let's get to it. <laughs> um, no, right, this, this, there's a couple of parts to the question. So one is the discoverability kind of element of things and where we are with that. And another one is automatic composition and machine to machine use of APIs, right? So both big topics. On the discoverability, we have directories today that work. Um, they are, you know, if you go back to the web analogy, that's the kind of Yahoo way of doing things, right? Which is basically listing things if people don't know, but that was the way the web catalog started. A bunch of people curated a list. Um, a lot of organizations have internal catalogs that they use, which are just for their own APIs. And I think we're still at the number of APIs that that is a feasible thing. Um, it is really, really difficult. Almost every company we go to, they don't even know what APIs they have internally, right? So I think we need to get to a search method where people can just post that their API is available and we can start discovering them. That's a lot harder with APIs than it is with the web because the web is naturally linked. If I have a web page, I'm quite encouraged to link to you and you to link to me and then we can spider the whole thing. That doesn't happen with APIs. So definitely, um, it's a hard challenge. Um, I think we're, the pro part of the problem is we're still at the number of APIs, which is still amenable to directories. Like if we had 10x this number, then we would need search and we would need it better. But if we don't have search, then we might not get there. So we have a chicken and egg. So I, I think in areas like government, there's a huge benefit to doing initiative just for government, for example, to try to catalog and index those APIs. Um, even if they aren't perfect APIs, just try to get them together and get people visibility, and then people will build be better and better search. And I think the composition is hard. Um, there was a European Commission project, um, uh, City SDK, which I really liked. Um, one of the reasons is they standardized the kind of APIs a city would offer for its core services. That's great, because it means that every city can do a similar API interface onto their own infrastructure and then have the same app work in each city. That saves an enormous amount of time. And uh, so those kind of things, I think, will get automated better, because I can spend more effort automating one thing than for every single different API. So I could answer longer, but I'll, yeah. Uh, OK, Hopefully another yeah. round of applause for, for our speaker. Thank you.